Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's AgriLinks webinar from Citizen Security to Food Security, a cross-sector discussion of violence in Central America. We are looking forward to discussing the realities of working in zones of conflict and violence within our development programs. The context of violence means bringing special tools to bear on how we engage with these communities, from those in rural agricultural settings to those in urban settings. These issues loom large, as a lot of us know, and it is time that we as a development practitioners start bridging the knowledge gaps that keep us from meeting our food security goals. My name is Becky Williams, and I am a PhD candidate working at the University of Florida, and I work with the Feed the Future Innovate project to look at these issues in depth. I also served in the United States Peace Corps in Honduras, which is also where I conducted my dissertation research. I am very pleased to be moderating this cross-sector dialogue today. Our goal for today's webinar is to discuss the connection between citizen security and food security in ways that all of us can engage in development projects successfully despite violence and conflict. And AgriLinks is the knowledge sharing platform for the USAID Bureau for Food Security and is managed by the KDAD project. AgriLinks hosts regular seminars and special events to facilitate the exchange of knowledge among practitioners. Visit agrilinks.org where you can contribute to online discussions, submit resources, and post to the blog when you become a member. If you want more information, please email agrilinks at agrilinks.org. We have a fantastic panel of experts here today to discuss this topic. We have Karen Towers, who is the Education Team Leader in the Office of Regional Sustainability in the USAID Bureau for Latin America and the Caribbean. Karen specializes in education programming for at-risk youth and workforce development programs in crisis and conflict environments. Ken Baker is the co-founder and chief executive, officer, office, chief executive officer of Glasswing. Ken has worked abroad with the State Department in over 10 countries with Glasswing and previously served as the vice president of corporate relations at AmeriCare, a large international relief organization. We have Fernando Rubio from Juarez & Associates who is currently the project director for the Guatemala Lifelong Learning Project. Fernando has extensive experience in international development, having engaged in professional activities including monitoring and evaluation, basic education, teacher development, educational equity and gender, and more. And finally, we have Isabel Aguilar Maña, who serves as regional technical advisor in youth-related violence prevention for Catholic Relief Services in the Regional Office for Latin America and the Caribbean. Isabel specializes in violence prevention, particularly youth-related violence. And now I'm going to turn it over to Karen Towers from USAID to set the background and context for our discussion today. Karen? Thanks so much. Um, so I just wanted to start by talking a little bit and giving some context on the crime and violence in Latin America. Many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with this, but I see from the chat box and other things going on that um, others may not be as familiar. Um, so I have, I have a, a group of slides that I'm going to take you through just to provide some context for, for the ongoing conversation that we will have today. So crime and violence is one of the most important public health and public policy challenges facing us. At this point, I think in Latin America, the problem of violent crime is particularly acute in LAC. LAC is home to 28% of the world's murders, despite having only about 9% of the world's population. The region also includes eight of the top 10 most violent countries in the world and 40 of the, of the 50 most dangerous cities. And in 2013, San Pedro Sula in Honduras was ranked number one as the most violent country or the most violent city in the world um, in a non-active conflict environment. So that tells you about the type of crime and violence that that are that we're being affected by in Central America. When we look at this particular chart, crime and violence in Central America, that's up on your screen right now, you can see that Central America has seen a marked increase in homicides since 2007. Honduras leads the way with about 90 homicides per 100,000 inhabitants, followed by El Salvador with 41.2 and Guatemala with 39.9 per 100,000. By way of comparison, if you look at Mexico, which is on the lower level, it only had about 21.5 
homicides per 100,000 in 2012. So you can see how the Northern Triangle countries are really ex experience a tremendous amount of violence. If you look further at the chart, you can see that Honduras has um, had an increase in homicides since 2006, and that's been a steady increase. Guatemala has been relatively stable, and El Salvador has seen the most progress within the Northern Triangle as homicide rates has decreased by about 40 percent following the gang truce in March of 2012. But what this chart doesn't show is that the rate has begun to increase again as the truce has unraveled. So while its social and economic impacts extend throughout society, violence is extra extraordinarily regressive in its impact. Um, and to quote Gary Hoggins, locus effect, in terms of social and economic development, high levels of crime and violence threaten to undermine the best laid plans to reduce poverty, improve governance, and relieve human misery. So which is why this, this particular webinar is particularly important to looking at development and also how to deal with the issue cross-sectorally. Violence tends to be most heavily affected um, young people, women, minorities, and residents of poor areas. Within LAC, males between 15 and 29 are most frequently involved in perpetration as well as victimizations of violence. And so when you look at this particular slide, you're seeing the fact that the Americas is particularly affected by violence, but then the difference between men and women. And the fact that the blue figure represents the amount of males that are involved in violence, whereas the, the smaller red figure represents females. But we can't forget about the females that are disproportionately affected by domestic violence and other types of violence um, within these communities. So what's important, I think, particularly for this particular webinar is to look at rural versus urban dynamics and also the links between those. And I think we have a, a wonderful group of panelists who are at where the rubber meets the road in terms of looking at these issues. We mostly assume that gang violence and drug trafficking Drug trafficking is a very urban issue, and when we think about that, we think about the cities in San Pedro Sula, um, Tegucigalpa, other places in Guatemala City, or in San Salvador, where we're dealing with these issues. But I think we also need to remember the rural side of things. Um, in the rural areas, there's a tremendous amount of domestic violence within families. There's a tremendous amount of trafficking in persons in terms of looking at young girls also looking at food insecurity itself and the lack of economic opportunity. I think we saw in the summer of 2014 with the waves of unaccompanied minors arriving at the Mexican border that food insecurity and lack of economic opportunity were major, major drivers of that migration as well as the violence. And so looking at the links between those two that are mutually reinforcing are I think very important when we look at trying to deal with the issues um, in, in these Northern Triangle countries. I'm an education person, so I always like to look at it from this idea of looking at out-of-school youth. And we see that more than 40% of youth have left the school system by secondary school, basically. And so you're seeing large out-of-school youth populations that are neither studying nor working. And so when we look at school attendance, we see that for the, for the most part, around 10 or 11 at the secondary school level, we have youth leaving the, leaving the educational system and either looking for work or migrating um, or perhaps being recruited into gang violence. And there's a couple of reasons why um, you see large dropout rates at this particular level. The first are just pure economic factors, having to go to work, and the fact that the opportunity cost of staying in school is very high for families where that particular person may make more money being in the workforce and bringing income into the family. Also, the fact that secondary schools just tend to be less of a supply, and so they need to travel further distances, perhaps pay for more school supplies, so it's cost prohibitive. Other reasons, uh, number two, could be personal factors, things like sickness, and in the case of women, having to perform household activities and duties, perhaps pregnancy, perhaps marriage at an early age. Thirdly, crime and violence and insecurity. 
Um, our colleagues in El Salvador in the mission there will remember that we recently did a rapid education risk assessment in El Salvador to look at the links between crime and violence and school attendance and, and schools themselves. And we see that those schools that are on gang borders um, of two different gangs can become battlegrounds. And it's extremely difficult for youth to try and go to school in this type of environment. It's an insecure path to school. Being in school can sometimes also be threatening. And so you see dropouts because of that. And then we can just talk about just general quality as well. Um, the quality of schooling in Central America, um, especially at the secondary level, many times it's not relevant at the secondary level to, to the work life. And also just the quality of teachers and, and in general is an issue. And so looking at this as a whole, it's, it's great to have so many panelists that are working in different sectors. We know that, it, that violence impacts individuals, communities, institutions, industries, governments in these communities. And it really does take a cross-sectoral response to think about how to deal with that from a de developmental lens. And I look forward to talking um, and to listening today to some of the other presenters to talk about how we are doing that at the, at the, at the grassroots level. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karen. That was wonderful in setting the stage for what is going on in, in Central American context regarding violence. Um, so we'd like for each of our presenters to have a moment to introduce themselves and discuss the work that they're doing in this region. So if you could advance one slide, please. So Ken, would you give us um, an indication of the work that you're doing and, and the violence issues that you might be facing? We have our headquarters in, uh, here in El Salvador. And we have offices throughout Central America. And uh, we have projects running um, throughout Latin America. Um, we are very active in education, health, and, and community empowerment. And uh, community empowerment, a lot of that uh, has to do with volunteering, getting citizen participation in the projects that we, that we, um, that we have and the programs. Uh, we, um, you know, we spend a lot of our, our, our program a lot of our programs <clears throat> have to do with youth and work in the public school systems, and also we work in, in, in public clinics um, in both urban and rural areas. And we've been dealing, uh, you know, m much of our work is in the Northern Triangle of Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras, and we've had to deal with the challenges of violence uh, for, for, for a long time now. Um, we do feel that it has gotten worse, that it has gotten more challenging in the areas that we work in both urban and rural settings. And uh, you know, we work very closely with, uh, with the private sector to get them involved as we try to change public schools into, uh, try to make them into community schools so that they can be in session for more, more time than the four hours that the, 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 the children are typically in, and that they stay in school and, um, you know, stay off the streets. Uh, and are involved in educational and life skills uh, improvements and, and programs. And um, so we work very closely with the um, private sector, both multinationals and, uh, and local companies, and with the, with the USAID and the US government to provide these programs. And uh, you know, uh, in, the, in the rural areas, we work a lot in the agri with agricultural companies, coffee and sugar. And uh, as um, Karen and has noted that the rural areas have their, their set of challenges where they're more challenging actually than in the rural areas, uh, than in the urban areas. And um, I'm sure we'll get into that discussion more as, as the uh, conversation continues. But thank you again, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Ken. Um, let's pass it off to Fernando from, uh, from Juarez and Associates. Fernando, can you tell us a little bit about your work? Hi everyone, it's very nice to be with you about this interesting uh, topic. We, we implement the largest education project of USA mission in Guatemala. It has two, two areas. One is early grade reading, and we work in that with the Ministry of Education in, in the Western Highlands. The other piece is our school youth. Uh, we find our school youth at 15, 24. 
and these are people who left the school or were expelled by the, from the system uh, before they finish either primary education or the ninth grade or basic education that the Constitution calls for as mandatory and free for, for everyone. Most of our target population is, is coming from indigenous backgrounds. We conducted at the beginning of the project a participatory jobs youth assessment. And this allows us to identify a number of uh, issues related to, to violence and misbehavior. Uh, among them, labor exploitation is high. Those, those youth who are working usually receive less than the minimum salary. And oftentimes they work under no conditions that are related to anything that the labor legislation calls for. Gender-based violence is also important, particularly in in the family setting and uh, in the community setting. And especially for young women, gender-based violence is, is an important issue that we have to, to deal with. Contrary to the human studies in the country, gun-related violence is, is not that important. It may exist particularly in rural settings with high density of population, but by and large is not an issue. However, uh, the, the Western Highlands are located into the border, close to the border. So this is a traffic problem. We have found that the youth participating in our programs are exposed to uh, drug trafficking. They are a risk of being consumers, or they may be sometimes threatened by the, the traffickers. Human traffic is, is also an issue. Uh, illegal immigration, as everybody knows. Hey, Fernando, I'm sorry to Fernando, I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but you're a little bit hard to hear. Would you mind just um, speaking a little bit more clearly, maybe back up from the microphone just a little bit? Okay. Uh, how is that better? Okay. I, 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 That's I definitely a little better. Okay. I was indicated that you face uh, trafficking related violence. There are a number of traffic sessions. One is human trafficking, illegal immigration, and also human trafficking related to labor exploitation and sexual driven exploitation. Uh, drug trafficking is also an issue in the, in the area. And of course, there is illegal commerce between Guatemala and Mexico that also exposes youth to a difficult, difficult situation. Uh, how, we, how we deal with this? Uh, one of the things we found is that youth participation is low, and a number of a high number of youth may indicate that they don't want to participate, as high as 40% among those who didn't finish basic education. Uh, there is a lot of mistrust. Part of it comes from governments failing to provide services in the past, but also because this is a post-conflict area, and there is a historical situation in which people coming from outside of the communities are mistrust. Uh, there is apathy, and you may also interpret this as a learned helplessness. So why bother? I cannot help myself. And things are not going to change. We have built uh, youth encounter spaces, which are safe spaces for out of school youth who have a safe environment in which they can interact and participate. We, have, we are building youth networks around these issues, and we are helping to provide alternative education services, workforce development, and training in specific trades that youth are demanding, and we're trying to link this education and workforce development effort with the labor market and with entrepreneurship activity. All in all, so let's go ahead and pass it off to, uh, thank you, thank you, Fernando. Let's pass it on to Isabel. Isabel, can you give us a, a Sure. Hello, everyone. Um, I work as, 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 as you already know, I work for Catholic Relief Services in the regional office for Latin America and the Caribbean. We, we started to develop a regional strategy, a re, regional youth strategy 
in 2015, trying to move, um, uh, trying to scale up our our models, our methodology that we have developed successfully in El Salvador uh, since uh, uh, five years ago. So uh, now, um, if, if you can move up, please, the next slide. Do you hear me? OK. Uh, first, it's important to, to underline that our philosophy is that youth in even the poorest and most violent neighborhoods have the power to change the direction of their lives and that of, of their communities. Uh, our holistic approach uh, is uh, uh, focusing in uh, youth at risk to address the academic, social, and personal challenges they face by providing concrete opportunities for employment, education, and leadership. Our youth strategy has three main um, pillars. One is provide direct services to CRS and, and our partners. We have been uh, developing uh, our main uh, programs or models, which are the youth build uh, model. We are now uh, developing it, it in El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala, Nicaragua, and Mexico. Um, the youth uh, silk groups, which means savings and internal lending communities, especially for, for youth. And as a complementary methodology, uh, the strong families. Uh, now, with all with these three uh, methodologies, youth builders, silk groups, and strong families, we moved. Uh, we we designed a, spe a specific um, way to approach to the most at risk youth, including gangs and former gang members in the Salvador. And our model is called Second Chances. We have been uh, uh, now. Uh, we started with this model in El Salvador, but we are uh, uh, nowadays implementing it in Guatemala in a well-recognized uh, red or hotspot called uh, Ciudad Quetzal. The second pillar is how to build evidence of effectiveness, which means a research uh, a research agenda. Now we are conducting randomized control trial for to assess the, the how the, our youth build model is really working. We know that 80 percent of the of youth uh, that participated in in our program get a job, start a business, or go back to school by the end of the program. And our third pillar is how to strengthen gov the government. Uh, to sponsor youth workforce development and violence prevention programs, which of course include engage with the with the private sector to ensure that all training programs are demand driven, and and of course to to place uh, young people in jobs. Uh, this means an, uh, uh, clearly uh, an influence uh, strategy. And can you move to the next slide, please? And finally, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we are now moving um, with the support of the Inter-American Development Bank. We are uh, um, implementing a randomized control trial to demonstrate the, the impact of uh, our youth builders model, which uh, uh, CRS develops in, in alliance with Youth Build International and with uh, uh, um, many other partners in the region, like uh, like uh, Fe Alegría, like um, uh, Central Paz Barbara Ford, Caritas uh, El Salvador, Caritas Guatemala, etc. And also, we have we are we have developed tools to measure resilience in youth. It's uh, worth to to mention that uh, our Youth Build program has tools that assess youth resiliency three times during the training course, and it allows us to really uh, uh, have uh, collect evidence on how we are helping uh, uh, the, uh, these young people to change their lives and as part of, of their, 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 our leadership program to contribute to help to change the life of their communities. Thank you, Isabel. That was very interesting. I think we all are going to want to know more about what exactly you did in your project to have such a, a success rate of, of, of students or children, uh, young people at risk of violence going 
back into education or getting a job. That's uh, something that's of interest to all of us. So we're going to open up the floor for questions. We have some questions that are already prepared, which is what we will begin with. However, if you have a question uh, for the panelists, please feel free to write that into the chat window. Um, and we'd also like to ask you to tell us, um, those of you working in agriculture and education or in any development projects, how has violence affected your projects or your ability to get the work done that you need to in these areas. So let's go ahead and start asking um, some questions. So Ken, if we could start with you, Ken, you have a large number of that are working in the field in El Salvador. I think that you told me um, over 70 people um, working largely in education. And working in violence or working with violence was not necessarily um, the aim of your project until it started becoming a theme in your project. And so can you tell us, you know, how did violence affect your project and your, and your staff and, and why did you start getting involved in, in trying to incorporate work on uh, youth violence into your program? Ken, I'll pass it off to you. Great, thank you, Becky. Uh, yeah, we, you know, our focus is is on you know education and health programs. And years ago, we uh, we started seeing the need and, and um, to really, you know, when we look at the, what were the factors in the violence that was that was gripping the the, the Northern Triangle countries, we found that uh, you know education and even uh, employment were just two of the, of the three of the, the largest factors, and one of the largest factors being a sense of belonging for youth. And a lot of this we attribute to the migration that, is, that, is, that has uh, been so immense coming from these three countries, leaving behind broken, broken homes and, uh, and, and, a, and a lack of uh, positive role models and uh, caring adults in, in, in children's lives. And uh, so we became more focused on getting pri the private sector and also parents uh, to get a lot more involved in the educations uh, of, of youth in both rural and urban areas. And we, we, we find that through different clubs, through different competitions, kids develop pride. Uh, that can be anything from a glee club to uh, to debate clubs, to leadership clubs, to girls clubs, where they are matched with, uh, you know, with classroom staff and also with uh, volunteers from the private sector, who meet with them weekly to prepare them either for competitions or just to, uh, work on them developing their life skills and educational skills. And what we found is we were trying to extend the school day, as I mentioned, but also uh, become a substitute for in a lot of cases where the kids were most at risk is where they would be going to uh, you know uh, empty homes or out on the street where the, where the gangs do provide a sense of belonging that we could provide that and also a sense of hope and uh, as Becky says over the last number of years the violence has has uh, gotten more challenging and I just wanted to uh, address that part of the question uh, we have found you know for our staff that it is imperative that our programs are, 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 we don't call them violence prevention programs. We do not talk about gangs in our programs. What we talk about is opportunity for youth, and we have to keep our neutrality and our space, because if we are ever seen as uh, passing information or being a part of uh, anything from the press to the police to uh, other, other, other organizations that are taking on the gangs, our staff are in serious, uh, serious uh, under serious threat, as well as some of our students and our violent uh, and our volunteers. And we do work in maybe not the most red areas, but we do work in um, you know very pink areas, where it is critical. And uh, the toll that is you know if you don't do this right is is immense because people get killed and, uh, and, and threatened, and we have teachers and, and others that have been threatened. So keeping our space has been the, the key to having our staff safe over the last nine years. I can say that uh, in the schools, we have found that 
they respect gangs and, and, and delinquents, uh, find, uh, those looking for delinquency, find that they leave us, uh, they leave us be as long as they don't see us as a threat. They, they, they let the, the students participate in programs and we have had uh, very good success in, in, in the urban settings with this. Not to say that our students haven't been threatened, that we haven't had to face things. It's interesting that in the rural areas where we have staff working in uh, clinics, health clinics, we've had greater problems. We just about a month ago, we had three staff members from one rural, uh, a couple of rural clinics in one area leave the country without even uh, getting their last paychecks because of the threats that have been coming to coming to them. And I'm not sure if it's there's when there's there are more sitting ducks or if there's just less going on or you know the fact is we're really trying to figure it out ourselves right now but the rural areas that we work in in, in the three countries do face uh, we do have to address violence on a, on a, on a weekly basis so thank you Thank you, Ken. That was very interesting. There's so many interesting points that you brought up about issues with migration and broken families and um, the issues of sense of belonging. And one of the things that you said that really stood out to me is this issue of, of having to kind of navigate um, almost um, a coexistence with the more violent forces in the gang so that you're able to get your work done. Can you speak a little bit more to, to that aspect? Um, does that ever cause an issue with, with your programs if you are trying to um, stay away from um, any type of like uh, police action or anything? Does that ever cause you guys a, an ethics problem or any type of an issue there? Well, we Literally, I, I volunteer every week in uh, in, uh, in a public school that's in one of the one of the most difficult. Uh, well, it's a it's a very it's a very well known difficult area. But the the more difficult areas, and I'm sure the other panelists can speak to this, are the areas where there's sort of a gang toss up, where one gang is not in control. Um, where there's gray areas, that is probably the most dangerous areas that we face. This area is is completely controlled by one of the most famous gangs here in San Salvador. And uh, they control the whole neighborhood of about 7,000, 7,000, a population of 7,000. And what happens is the government comes in and, and because it's high profile, they like to do roundups and they like to make examples of them. And also the media likes to cover it. And so, and, and cover, and, and what happens also is that they use other vehicles or other ways to get information of what's happening in that in the in that neighborhood because the the gang heads uh, of El Salvador are, are from there. They're, they're they're calling the shots from prison. So we we always and it's not just there, but we always have to ask. We do not directly talk to gang members. Uh, we will talk to community leaders and uh, have our staff say, "Hey, you know, Glasswing has nothing to do with anything." And when these roundups happen, we just kind of let the word out there again, like Glasswing is absolutely neutral and has nothing to do with anything confronting the community or the gangs. Uh, because yes, that, that could lead to very serious consequences, especially for an organization like ourselves that relies a lot on volunteers. If we have a, a bad incident, that's going to that's gonna hurt our ability to, to get others. Thank you, Ken. That, that's very interesting. Um, Fernando, can we get you to, to make some comments on this as well? Because in your programs, you often will, will, um, will deal with violence as an unexpected part of your pro uh, projects. And you use a masculinities approach in your work. So what, what does masculinities have to do with the situation of violence? And, 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 and how is that related to the development work that you're doing? Fernando? Okay, uh, I'm here. Uh, when we first started this project, we didn't consider violence to be an issue. However, we found out soon enough that violence was a very important issue for, for the participant group. Uh, one of the things is gender related to gender based violence. This is related in, in, in very important part to the traditional stereotype of which is uh, 
male and female behavior. So young male and male in general would consider violence against women to be part of the natural behavior which there is a normalization of violence on the part of, of men. And women felt by and large that it uh, was natural that they may be subject to, to violence. So one of the things that we are doing to address this is trying to put together an approach that has been used by USAID in, in different projects uh, in which we try to characterize and teach young male different ways to be a male. And this is called the new masculinity, so, or how to behave in a different way in which you are respectful from everyone, and particularly young male became aware of when their particular behavior may be considered a threat, may be characterized as a violence against, against women. So this is a new a new development. One of the things that we are also doing is orga organizing safe spaces for, for youth. Those safe spaces, we call them youth encounter spaces, allow for youth space in which they can interact, they can share different things, and those, those spaces provide a place in which they can feel at ease dealing with different issues, including including violence. Uh, the other thing that is, is important to understand is that part of the part of the issue of dealing with violence was right along the lack of education. So many of these, of these participants didn't finish primary education. Average schooling for them is about four, four grades of education. So you, you need to, to use approaches in which reading is part of the issue, is part of the solution, but also using uh, which uh, more psychomotor approach, a more play-based approach that allows you to participate even though the reading skills are not particularly particularly high. So using this game-based approach and, and more participatory psychomotor, uh, psychomotor activities allows them to express themselves, whereas if you have reading based materials, they often feel that they don't have the required skills to do so. So it's a combination of basic education activities for our school group with a particular approach that allows them to be fully engaged. Thank you, Fernando. That is very interesting. You and Ken both discussed um, games, soccer, or other sports, or uh, getting people, uh, young men, involved in that way. I mean, but you also both mentioned um, the lack of sense of belonging and um, and the the pride that comes with being part of a gang or part of a violent group. Um, and I've read some interesting research that um, that's saying that, especially in these northern triangle countries of El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras, that um, um, education is starting to become feminized in the sense that men, young men are seeing education as something that only girls do, that's something that's not manly. So, you know, what do you do in that situation and have you seen that? Isabel, can, can you speak to that? Because I know you work directly with at-risk youth. Uh, according to my experience, I think, I think both men and women uh, um, look for, for the education as an as a, an opportunity that is missing in their lives. For some or so for diverse reasons, uh, um, they, they, they know that, uh, that um, a school can provide them uh, uh, an opportunity to, to improve their lives, but they cannot participate in, in they, cannot, uh, um, they cannot have access to, to, to education due to poverty or due to violence or, or, or due to the, the, the absence of, 
of uh, uh, a coverage, a educational coverage, especially uh, uh, if we are talking about secondary levels. I think uh, it's it's uh, masculinity and and the way the way macho culture is affecting or inspiring youth to to be violent does does not pass exactly through the to education or not uh, or education. It, it, they they recognize in general, both in general, women and, and men, they recognize that, edu that going to school is important. And uh, they, they when, when you interview or when you um, share w w uh, I spaces with them, they, they often tend to, to, to feel bad because of, of that, that lack of opportunity. So I think I think uh, uh, what what uh, what is missing is is the is that the or coverage or, or educational coverage in many many areas here in North, especially in the North Triangle countries uh, uh, um, the 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 system um, is uh, is only covering uh, primary education not not secondary level education so. It's precisely the level in which in which adolescents are, are have to go to school, and uh, and uh, and the, uh, also the poverty is 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 uh, being a key factor. Many 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 adolescents, especially in Guatemala and, and uh, nowadays, are, are are not going to school due to the to the, the lack of, of resources. Their parents are uh, are are not. Uh, able families are not providing them uh, the, 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 all the resources they need to go to school and due to that we are we are we are they are they are abandoning the school they are assuming uh, informal jobs or, or many in, in the case of women they are um, in, in a, a premature uh, marriages or, or they are forming a, a family new families in a very very young, uh, I, I, uh, especially in, in these countries. So I think I think to 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 summarize a little bit. I think it's not a matter of, of if you're a man or a woman. Both appreciate the opportunity if they if they have. Thank you, Isabel. That's, that's uh, a, a very interesting. So we'd like to ask the audience, and you can just type in the box, is, is anybody else out there using a masculinities approach with young men, whether to address gender-based violence, to address um, participation in agriculture or education or in any other way? And, and, and what do you um, see as, ha as happening with this um, masculinities-based approaches? And for our panel, while we're getting responses on that, I'd like to ask, uh, as we go back to Ken, and uh, Ken, we have a, a question for you in, um, oh, I think I just lost it, apologies. Um, Ken, a couple of people have been talking about um, gangs and, and such, and so we have a question from Madeline. Um, are you able to employ or make any use of former gang members um, in your work, and if so, you know, are they able to to, to help you in any way in dealing with these issues that you're facing in your project. Ken? Yeah, thank you. Um, we do not have a specific focus or program that, uh, that tries to integrate gang members and ex-gang members. That is, uh, for, for us at least, what we've seen and um, what we've, you know, researched with other organizations, it's very complicated. and. Uh, we, as I mentioned, our programs, after school programs, uh, life skills programs, and the, the various pro technology programs, the ones that we have, they're open to they're open to everyone and anyone that's going to participate, be interested, and and um, you know, uh, be a positive part of of, of the program. Uh, there are there are organizations that feel there are directly with ex-gang members and trying to find employability and uh, um, and my hat's off to them because that is really complicated work. Ours, ours is we don't know who's a gang member, we don't know who's an ex-gang member. Uh, if we have, you know, employ, employment uh, programs, uh, youth, youth job readiness programs, uh, everyone is, avail is, is able to, 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 to join them. Um, but as, as I said, one way to keep ourselves 
insulated that we found over the years is to not really address the uh, address address the gang situation. Thank you, Ken. That's that's very interesting and probably very good advice for many of our our people working in projects that are having to deal with violence but don't want to directly engage with with gang members. Um, Karen, can I pass it off to you? Um, um, as far as, as the cross-programmatic um, view of this issue of violence, um, you know, several of our panelists have talked about the connection to education, um, but can you give us a little bit more um, on how a cross-sector approach to violence um, Sure. Um, maybe just to mention that um, at USAID, um, also very specifically under our CARSI programming, and CARSI, for those of you that don't know, it stands for Central America Regional Security Initiative, we've been looking very closely at um, what we're calling the community-based approach. So trying to identify communities that are particularly affected by gang violence or violence in general and looking at the different program areas that we as USAID work in, and that would be education, health, democracy and government, um, economic growth, environment, um, to take a look at how we're programming in those areas so that we're overlapping and making sure we're looking at the community as a whole. So for example, I work in education. We talked a bit in this, um, both Fernando and Ken talked, and Isabel talked a lot about education. So for example, perhaps the first thing you need to do is more on the DG side of things, the democracy and governance side of, of, of things to look at, you know, is that community stable enough to work in? Is the violence at such a point where some other development programs really can't work yet? And looking at dealing with that, that specific case from the beginning. If it is relatively stable and we can work in other programming areas, then how do we look at some of the particular sectoral things that are happening there? Perhaps in a school-based project, we would look at how can we use the school as a safe place for youth to gather and to, to learn and to study. Um, on the health side, we need to be looking at um, things like early marriage, um, or marriage in general, early pregnancy, really looking at also kind of the psychosocial services that we can offer in a community like this where, where you know, almost every community member is somehow being exposed to violence, whether it's outside of their homes in addition to, to inside of their homes. Obviously looking at the economic growth projects and looking at opportunities for um, for employment, which is really important, giving people an alternative in these communities. You know, a lot of times youth are looking towards gangs to provide some kind of stability, either economically or in another way, and providing other routes um, for employment is important. And also, obviously, in the rural areas as well, looking at food security and, and, and the other issues that we're dealing with there. So I think um, it's really important for projects to talk with each other, um, like we're doing here today, I think, about how we can share lessons learned as well as um, really be ways to refer youth from one project to another. Um, we realize that they, they need a lot of support, and there's a social safety net kind of aspect to things that I think you can only do if you're really working cross-sectorally and not in just kind of a stove type, a, a stove pipeline. Thanks very much. Thank you, Karen. And taking a step back to our question about masculinities, we got a, a very good comment from Christina Anfrey. Uh, the USAID funded gender agriculture from policy to practice, the GAP project, delivers masculinity workshops to men and women in western Honduras. The project aims to improve policies at the local level and with in rural credit institutions to make them more equitable. Uh, the program provides gender equality training, but the focus on masculinity is the results of the recognition that we often overlook men in the discussion of gender equality. The project has been successful in establishing more equitable credit rules and in getting women's economic initiatives funded by local governments. Thank you for that comment, Christina. So how do we, how do we integrate lessons from education that we are, are hearing into um, to projects where, you know, such as agriculture. Uh, so 
some of you work more in urban areas, some of you more in rural areas, and many of our participants here today are interested in food security. So what are some of the takeaways from your projects that could be extended to agricultural education or agricultural projects? Um, can I pass it off to you, Ken? Sure. Uh, you can hear me now. Uh, yeah, with, with our programs, uh, we find that, you know, actually the, the kids, the youth are even hungrier for, for educational opportunities, for uh, all sorts of opportunities and learning in rural settings. And they're much more, there's typically less aid that gets, gets to the rural areas. And we find that we can also have a, a greater impact. They, they, they probably have, uh, probably, they may be more behind in certain academic uh, aspects. So, you know, we, we know that with our staff and with our volunteers, when we can get out and, and, and arm the more rural areas and the, the parts of where we do have uh, programs with the agriculture industry um, in sugar and coffee, even in uh, textile, uh, textiles uh, further out that they really take to the programs. They love to, they'd like to take pride in them. And, you know, we do try, we try to get as much program as we can out to those areas. It's just more challenging because of the distances and, uh, and that you, 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 you uh, are, your programs have obviously less, less students um, in, in, in a much greater area. But, you know, same things that we use for the for the urban areas, we, we find are successful in our in our um, when we work with the with the different businesses in in their areas of, of a sphere of influence, sphere of interest, and uh, and you know we also find that field trips or just exposure to outside things, to technology, they they, they really they really uh, take to it, and we try to get them exposed to coming into the into the bigger towns and uh, and. Participating with the with the kids from the urban areas as well, we try to do interchanges. Uh, well, our competitions uh, have both both the rural and the urban areas uh, represented, uh, and it's amazing when they come together. Uh, those interchanges, how uh, there's a, there's a real transfer of experience and uh, and learning that, that is involved in those areas. So I, I would say that the, the our main program doesn't differ so much. Uh, we do have. Uh, Different kind of uh, challenges with violence in the in the rural areas, but um, but we find again that in the rural areas, if we can have a program program strong and consistent, that we can make a, actually a bigger impact in the in the rural areas. Thank you, Ken. That's very interesting. And in the chat window, we're seeing a lot of interesting comments from two of our presenters, Fernando and Isabel. Um, both talking quite a bit about mistrust in a community, about the machismo culture as risk factors for violence. And so, Isabel, can I pass it off to you to discuss a little bit about, um, about the issues facing rural areas and how those are maybe different than the issues facing urban areas, or are, is the violent, are the violence issues the same, or you know, how are they related? Can you speak a little bit about that? Yeah, of course. I think um, it depends on, on on what you consider rural area, and uh, of course, uh, which country are you talking about? Uh, for example, regarding in the North Triangle of Central America, you have to consider that in El Salvador, ru uh, rural areas are, are are quite different than in Guatemala and in Honduras. Um, in, 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 in Guatemala, for example, you, you have uh, all the Mayan culture, which is important to consider if you want to, to, to really design an, an, an integral approach. And, uh, and in Honduras, you have to consider as well, all, uh, even, even, in that, even though in that country the, the indigenous populations are less or, 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 are, or are, are not well recognized, there are, for example, uh, all the all the um, the Afro descendants, the, the Garifuna culture, and uh, all, all other Afro descendant group, groups, and also the Lenca culture, etc. So it, it depends. That's that's my my first key point. It depends on on, 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 on the on what what is rural and where 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 are you considering your your intervention. 
But I have to say that, that in general, as a general trend in the, um, lethal violence is, is a, a urban, a, an urban uh, aspect of, of all the, the, the levels of violence and, and crime we are facing. Uh, we have, uh, homicide rates, if you, can, if you analyze the trends, are, lo are localized in the, in the cities or in the municipalities around the cities, like in, in, in the area known as Gran San Salvador, or, or, the, or the, the, the municipalities around Guatemala City, for example. Also, it, it is the same pattern for San Pedro Sula, or, or, or Tegucigalpa, or, or, or La Ceiba. But uh, as, a, as a general uh, characteristic, you, you may, you, you, we need to recognize that in rural areas, uh, delicts or crimes are not uh, well registered due to the, 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 the weakness of, of, uh, of our uh, security and justice institutions. So it means that um, it implies that people that, uh, not, not, do not go to, to to the security, to the ministry, public ministry, or the police forces, to uh, to uh, say that something has happened. So the the the, the, the that's some uh, trends can be missing. We are misunderstanding that. Uh, and on the other hand, we can see that the, the in in many countries. Uh, rural areas are the, um, a main scenario for domestic and gender-based violence. So uh, it, it, of course, affects, uh, uh, affects the mainly children, uh, adolescents, women, and youth. So, and, and uh, you know, as you may know, uh, all the domestic abuses, all sexual abuses, uh, and gender-based violence. Uh, are, are, uh, uh, tend not to be considered in these countries as a public uh, issue. It, it, the, the families tend to, to avoid uh, facing these, these sources of, of violence. So uh, as, uh, you, we can say that in, in, in rural areas, two are the main sources of violence. One is all all the violence related with gender aspects, like domestic violence, violence against women, violence against children and youth, considered, unfortunately, as a, as a, a private uh, issue. And, um, and in the uh, urban areas, I, I, I don't want to, to, to consider that we do not have these, these sources of violence, but in, in the urban areas, uh, the, the main trend of violence and, and crime are, are lethal violence related, of course, with guns. With, with guns and, unfortunately, youth people being involved uh, in that dynamics, both as, as victims or perpetrators. But, um, and uh, finally, I want to, to, to underline that uh, in the rural area, we need to um, consider uh, two aspects of the social, political, and economic dynamics which is the, the presence of, of um, organized crime, especially in Honduras and in Guatemala. There are, in, if you analyze the, the map of, of our countries, uh, the, the um, routes for all, sources, all kinds of traffic, of, of illicit traffic are, are there, and also a, 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 a source of conflictivity and uh, probably violence, which is uh, re uh, the, the, all the, um, the lack of governance related with uh, industrial, uh, 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 extractive industries. Thank you, Isabel. So we've heard a lot about the issues that are uh, the issues of violence themselves, which can can be very overwhelming when you when you hear all of them. But, you know, broken families, migration and immigration, gang-related violence, uh, gender-based violence, rural, 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 urban, rural. It's just it's, it can be really overwhelming. So in this last um, 25 minutes that we have. 
Um, let's take a shift and start talking a little bit more about the things that you, you have, as panelists, have done that have that have been successful and, and how they were successful. What did, what did you do? Um, so if, if we could start with Karen. Um, Karen, can you tell us from the AID perspective, have you seen any projects that have been particularly successful at addressing violence and what, what did they do and how can we um, transfer those successes to our other projects? And those of you in the audience, please feel free to comment on this as well. Sure. I just shared in the chat bar a study that was recently conducted by our CARSI team here on what works in reducing community violence, which I think is a nice report because it looks at cross-sectoral areas of things that you know people are trying to do in these areas, from community policing to employment programs to food security programs to other types of programs of what we see is really working. One of the things that comes out pretty clear in this report and in projects in general, I think, is cognitive behavioral therapy, recognizing that these youth are usually coming to projects that we're all working in being affected by an extreme amount of violence, whether it be in the home or in their community, and realizing that um, we need to we need to help them and, and counsel them through a lot of those things. And so cognitive behavioral therapy, also looking at, you know, how do we help these youth kind of work through anger management issues and other things that will make them kind of stop and think before they act. And the most successful projects that I've seen are ones that are open minded, that sit down and listen to the youth that are coming in and know that they're coming with a lot of problems and so that they need to stop and think about that. And that for for example, we can't expect someone that's going to be teaching life skills, for example, for example, to be prepared to do also counseling, yet we need to help that particular facilitator or trainer kind of think through of how to deal what, with those particular issues. Or if it's in a school setting with the teacher, of how to deal with those anger management issues and other issues that are, that are happening um, with that particular youth. Also to look for warning signs, you know, kind of within the youth uh, uh, of things to look out for. So I would say cognitive behavioral therapy. The other thing I would say is starting as early as possible. I know a lot of our USAID programs tend to start, um, you know, 16 to 24 um, or 15 to 24 if we're looking at employment programs or other type of programs. Um, but I think we need to start as early as possible, um, recognizing the fact that if you catch youth earlier, you know, 10 or even earlier, um, you're going to be more effective in terms of um, working with them along along with them as they're as they're dealing with the issue in their community. So so those are the two things I would say, CBT and also um, early intervention if possible. Thank you, Karen. That's very helpful. Um, Fernando, I'd like to ask you the same question. What have, what have you done that has worked well and, um, and and how can we transfer that to our own projects? Well a couple a couple of things. Uh, first what we will do different. And the, the one thing that we will do different would be to design the intervention from the start up with a violence prevention component. We introduced that after the evidence shows that we needed to. So we know now enough that we could design project intervention with that in mind. A couple of things on, 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 on prevent, in violence prevention. One is this safe spaces for youth. We found out that there were no spaces in which out of school youth could participate. Uh, for, for males, it was mostly soccer or football, uh, and no spaces for, for females other than church. So creating and building spaces in which youth can be safe and they can feel safe are, are important. The other thing is integrating into alternative education programs reduction of barriers that are product of violence. We have about 20% of all participants who are female with children. Uh, and they, they, they get pregnant early on or they were abandoned by the husband or they were abused. It's hard to, to determine which are the reasons of the early pregnancy. But the fact is that those young women face additional hardship when they have a child to take care of. 
So we ha we are introducing a specific support for young women with one or more children, so that that they can first attend to to the education or the labor training activities, and second, if they have to bring their children with them, we are sort of providing child attention for those children, so that uh, young mothers can attend and participate in the education classes or the education activities, where while uh, a volunteer, usually a volunteer, is attending those, those children. Otherwise, uh, women not only are the victim of, of some sort of gender-based or sexual-based violence, but this become an additional barrier in terms of poverty to participate in education services. So I would say those two things. Uh, one, creating a spaces in which youth can feel safe and they can participate in, in a safer environment. And two, targeting victims of violence, in sort of second, second round probation activities, particularly women, who you oftentimes are at a bigger disadvantage and face bigger barriers to participate in these programs. Fernando, I, I'd like to ask you one more question. Um, when when I worked in did my research in the past couple of summers in Honduras, um, I saw something that was different from my Peace Corps time in that in that there were many women's soccer teams in Western Honduras where I was conducting my work. It seemed that almost every rural community had one, even if there were only you know eleven, twelve people uh, that participated. So um, so we have a question from the audience. Um, from Madeline, are, are there any efforts to get women and girls involved in sports or activities such as those to to help them with you know their self-esteem or, or to get more involved? Certainly so. There, there are soccer teams of, of, of women in Guatemala, but mostly in urban settings. Uh, in, in, the, in the rural settings, particularly in school settings, women usually do basketball. Uh, what we're doing is that we integrate different sort of uh, activities. That's what I characterize as psychomotor activities. That may involve uh, games or they may involve sports on or, or some other sort of, of physical activities that allows both male and females to participate. We are not doing a sport uh, driven activities at this time, but uh, it's been proposed uh, several times by youth that uh, they would be interested in in participating in in sport like activities. So we just starting the the planning the planning phase for the next year of the intervention. So next year we may have we may have some uh, sport driven activities for 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 women. Are all strengthening sport driven activities for, for males. So certainly that's part of the part of the solution, and, and we may have those uh, sport driven activities in the future, in addition to the to the more physical activities that, that we are developing now, game based or game driven, uh, that allows and motivates you to participate, particularly women. Actually, do not participate on this sort of activity. Thank you, Fernando, and um, and I know that Ken also has sports as as one of his interventions. And and Karen, you 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 um, have seen Aganar, which is a sports based program um, through USAID. Do you want us to uh, want to tell us a little bit about what that has to do with violence reduction? Um, so Aganar is a sports-based workforce development program um, that's been supported in the Caribbean and in Guatemala and Honduras for about eight years. It just recently ended, um, but it used sports as a vehicle, as really a unifying theme to teach life skills, uh, to teach workforce readiness skills, 
math and um, basic literacy skills, and then they moved into the more technical training and internships and placement and a job. Um, just to note, we're doing a five-year longitudinal impact evaluation study of that particular program. The program ended in September of 2015, but we were, we'll be having some midterm results from Guatemala and from Honduras actually this summer, and a year from now we'll be having long, long-term data. The idea is to follow the youth over time to see whether or not their employment is better, and if so, how, looking at their salary rates and also whether it's informal employment or not, whether they went back to school or for further study or not, or if they started their own business, also looking at risky behavior. And we're also actually looking at the sports component, whether or not sports made a difference in terms of how successful the program was and whether or not that's a development tool we should be looking at in all the different sectors. Thanks so much. Thank you, Karen. And, and we have a question that I think might be interesting to pose to the entire audience um, to chat and to put into the chat window. And is that has has anybody tried music as an intervention um, for youth violence? And um, I, I, there was an interesting comment here by Ricardo Brown Salazar. And um, Ricardo says that when he used to live in Honduras between '92 and '98, and and a little bit after that, it was most common that people would talk about soccer or football, as, as um, most of us call it. And when he went back to Honduras for two weeks in 2014, it was a shock that the main topic was now not football. The main topics were horrible crime stories. And I must say that for my own PhD work, I was not anticipating on studying violence until it became a surprising um, theme to my work. Um, so. We have about 15 minutes, so thank you to those um, that have shared questions and comments. And we're gonna, we have a couple more questions left. I'd like to turn it over to Ken, um, and I'd like to, to ask you, Ken, um, you know, as a, in your opinion, should we just try to avoid the violence issues, or should we address them head on? Is it, is it possible to avoid them, or you know, why, why should we integrate violence um, prevention or, or um, youth violence reduction into our development program? Well, I think um, we need to, to be too worried about violence because sometimes uh, it undermines the capacity of any initiative to, to move forward, it's especially uh, regarding the amounts of violence that we are looking in El Salvador, for example, or, or in Honduras, in some places in Honduras. Violence is, is related with, with the development from a from an structural structural perspective. Um, is not uh, poverty is in itself is not a risk factor, but of course uh, many many aspects of poverty are related with with major risk factors of of of, of being violent or of of, uh, of of being a victim of of violence. So I think. We, we need to, to consider that if we do not achieve um, um, uh, security, uh, uh, we, of course, we using this word security as a, uh, from the democratic perspective, if we don't, if we don't um, achieve uh, um, the security levels that allow people to, to, to live really, to, to develop themselves, to, to to really be agents of, of, of their own lives and, and their own communities, to, to shape their own future, we are not going to, 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 to um, really achieve our, our development goals. That's why nowadays the, 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 the sustainable development goals uh, recognize that. Uh, I, I don't remember exactly if it's a, a, which, if it's a, a 16 or 17th goal, but but it recognizes that we need to to really build a peaceful a relationships, a peaceful relations within communities, groups, and institutions to really shape development. So, uh, and on the other hand, we need to, to 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 analyze further which aspects are triggering in a, from a more direct perspective which aspects of poverty are uh, fuel, fueling the major risk factors for violence. For example, um, 
uh, here in Guatemala, uh, um, um, malnutrition, undernutrition is, is related and with, uh, with uh, the amounts of uh, migration. And you know many the, the 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 ways that migrants are are are, are traveling uh, uh, means uh, mean a, a, a path of full of violence of all sources of violence. So I think we need to to really uh, consider that both are com coming together, uh, and we if we want to to really uh, design integral approaches, we need to take into account. The, the main sources of violence that are and conflict, not only violence, violence and conflict that are in our areas of, of intervention. Thank you, Isabel. I think that's great advice. So we, we have one last question, but before we ask, please um, please be sure to fill out the polls that you see here. Um, and and I'd like to pass this last question off to Ken. Let me see if Ken is back and has his microphone working. Yes, he does. Um, so our last question for you, Ken, if you could help us out, in, in what ways might food security or nutrition interventions best integrate with the work that you are doing? Or vice versa, how can your work integrate with the food security uh, field, in, in, specifically regarding the issues surrounding violence? Thank you, Becky. I, I think that, you know, the one of the major challenges in everything that we face in education and health and community and with violence, it, the, the major challenge is that it's so comprehensive. It's, uh, you know, one of the, I know one of the major uh, initiatives here in El Salvador a time ago was, you know, nutrition and how to get nutrition in the schools. And, you know, if kids aren't receiving the proper nutrients, they're not going to learn, they're not going to participate. I mean, we, we see it in our programs and we've seen it in studies. So, you know, the, uh, the one, one area is always to look at ways to integrate, you know, the public schools in, in, in programming uh, because that, that's really one of the, one of the, uh, you know, uh, the, the bases of, of, of a community. And, uh, and also with the, um, with, um, so w w nutrition is, is a critical, critical area of that and working with, uh, you know, the, the private sector in in, in in the more rural areas to see how you can make your programs relevant to them and uh, and, and their employees and because you know there's not as many uh, private sector out there but if you can show which is one of the things that we try to do show them how important it is to have a strong community around their around their uh, you know where they do business. You, will, you can get support for them, and you can also use them as a mouthpiece to, uh, to you know, that's one, it's a one-stop shop for getting hundreds of or, or thousands of individuals uh, in, in some communication campaigns and, and, and all sorts of different things. So we shouldn't shy away from the private sector in, the, in, in that area as well. And uh, I just, and I'm sorry, I, I, I got, I lost for a second there, but, um, you know, one of the, one of the important things is, is that I, I think that it leads to success is that uh, public schools can be safe areas and if they can be adopted by the communities around them, whether it's agriculture um, or other or the private sector, even the rural areas, it is, it, is a, it is a great way to provide safe spaces and opportunities to work on different um, practices uh, moving forward. Thank you very much, Ken. And, and so some important takeaways from today is uh, that we've heard from our participants is in um, starting early with youth violence pre uh, prevention, the, the role of cognitive behavioral therapy, a lot of um, interest in getting young people involved in sports and education, and uh, we had a lot of interesting comments about getting youth involved in music, um, providing opportunities for other activities, uh, training staff and skills to deal with violence, You're the development project staff, um, because it's going to, in these areas that are experiencing high levels of volume, uh, excuse me, high levels of violence, it's inevitable that violence is going to have an impact on your projects, so prepare your staff for that. Um, provide safe spaces for youth. Um, look at gender-based interventions and the, the different types of violence between rural and urban areas. Um, creating community. Um, and providing uh, young men with a with um, a sense of identity and trust in the community. So those are some really interesting and important points. 
Um, I'd like to thank everyone for joining, and special thanks to the Feed the Future Innovate Project and our speakers, Ken from Glasswing, Fernando from Juarez & Associates, uh, Karen from USAID, and Isabel from Catholic Relief Services. And before you sign off, please take the closing poll you see on your screen. And for those in the room, please fill out the quick evaluation form. Um, the information from both help AgriLinks improve these learning events. Um, all post-event product, post products will be posted on AgriLinks, and everyone will receive a post-event email with all of the relevant links. We look forward to seeing you in the future events and online at agrilinks.org, where we can continue the discussion. Because in addition to putting on events like this, Agrilinks hosts contributions from experts like you in the room um, or on the webinar today. Sharing even the smallest piece of information um, can help other practitioners improve their products or programs. So log on, read others to say, have this, read what others have to say, and please contribute. And there were several publications on this topic that Innovate has um, put up on their websites about um, um, education interventions for youth violence, the, the drivers behind youth violence, and we will be soon publishing a, a rather extensive um, thematic study on the drivers behind youth violence and how development interventions can address these issues. So please take a look at those as well as the three blogs that we posted on this topic, which you can find um, on at agrilinks.org. So thank you to everybody, and um, and we hope to, that this was an, um, a productive use of your time and an interesting event for all of you. And thank you again to our presenters.